All right, let's start. I will be doing some uh, general information first, and then we will continue with domain modeling, the last few uh, items to go through there. And I think the largest part of this second lecture today will be uh, working on a domain model problem. You will get the problem and you will work on it, create a domain model, and we will uh, take a look at how a model could look for that problem. So it will be pretty much similar to the workshop that you will be doing this week also. But first, some uh, stuffs to go through. We have a new DICE game implementation on the GitHub repo that was contributed by a student. So we now have, have the both Java and C Sharp implementations of the first lecture DICE game. Feel free to add other implementations also. Some uh, clarifications on the workshop groups and on the written exam. Uh, first of all, this is the first week with the workshops. It is good to get a group groups organized so that you don't run around the first few minutes of the workshop and find a group. So if you're efficient, form the groups now. Yeah? Yeah, you select your own groups. Uh, you are free to work with anyone you want to work with. And you can also switch groups between uh, the different grades. So three people can work together for grade eight, three and then switch to two people or bring in another third, fourth member uh, into the group for grade four. So you are free to mix the groups however you want, would like to. But it is important that you write down the members that contributed to your work. Questions on the groups? Uh, Nadim, uh, for the VECCO students, wanted you to mail your groups to him. So if you're a VECCO student listening to this, uh, you should form your groups and send an email with the group formation to Nadim uh, before the workshop. And you guys have the workshop on Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the workshops have, have different uh, grades, different three steps. And the focus of the workshop is to work on step number, the first step for grade number three. So don't run along and, and start doing for grade number four and grade number five on the workshop. Focus on grade number three. And then if you want to, you can continue working on grade number four and grade number five. And the goal of the workshops is to get you going, get you on some kind of right path, and hopefully if you work hard and if you uh, find the right way, you should be able to finish at least the first workshop on the actual opportunity, but uh, probably you won't, and, and you will have to work some, uh, some more towards the deadline. So you don't have to finish the workshop on the opportunity, but you have the chance for tutoring and uh, getting a good start. And as we are quite a lot of students on the course now, we are uh, enclosing 100 students, so there will be no opportunity for every group to uh, present their work towards the end of the workshops. So if you would like to present something, uh, please contact your uh, tutor and he will make sure that you can show something to your fellow students. That's a good opportunity to get feedback from both other students and from the tutor showing your work. Uh, yeah, so you work on your workshops, you hand them in before the deadlines. Um, you will do a peer review for grade three on the grade three work. Everyone will do peer reviews. You will get feedback on the peer reviews, and you can continue your work until the final deadline. 
So if you get a lot of feedback, you can refine your models and solutions to your different problems. And towards the end of the course, you will have a written exam. The written exam will establish pass or fail. So you work on your workshops. You may be due for grade four on some workshop and grade five on some workshops. Then you do the exam, and the, exactly the same exam for every student. It's not harder or, or easier for, for any grade. It's just to establish pass or fail. You pass the exam. We use the workshops and the steps you have completed therein, and the quality of your workshops to establish your final grade for the course. Questions? Yeah. You will probably need to work on your free time also on the workshop problems. Possibly the first workshop could be completed within the four hours that you have, depending a little bit on how well prepared you are and if you get it uh, a smooth start, so to speak. Uh, probably not. No, not each, each workshop uh, is not weighed equally. Typically, the first workshop, it's a little bit easier to get you started in object-oriented thinking. The second workshop requires quite a lot of time, but it's not really that hard. The third workshop does not really require that much time, but it's harder. So in the second workshop, you have a lot of stuff to do that you must do. So typically, we uh, use the third workshop, has a greater influence, influence on your final grade, and the second workshop has a little bit less influence, and the first workshop yet a little bit less. So if you go for grade number three for this workshop, you still have a, have a good opportunity to get grade four or five even on the course by doing higher grade for the other two workshops. Uh, get the question here, does the tomorrow's workshop count for the grade? Uh, no, not really. You don't have to be at the workshops if you don't want to, but it's your chance to get a good start, get some tutoring. Uh, so I recommend you to be there, but it's not mandatory to be there. There will be no attendance or something like that. So if you get sick or if you really can't make it, that's fine. You can work on your own or in a group later on also. Do we work on the workshops individually or can we do it in pairs? You can do it in small groups, up to three people. And you can do it individually also if you prefer that. I actually recommend doing it in small groups because it's a little bit easier to, to uh, get things right if you're a few more people. It is easier that you kind of like get the wrong path if you just work on your own. Also, you get more training in actually communicating your uh, analysis and design ideas. When will we decide the groups? You will decide the groups whenever you would like to decide them. So you form the groups whenever you like it. Any more questions regarding the groups, the workshops, or the exams? Feel free to put questions in the forum, for example. Uh, yeah, there is a workshop in Växjö. It is led by Nadim Abbas. You have your workshop uh, on Thursday between 10 and 14.
I think you should be in the room D1172V. It's a computer laboratory. And for the uh, Kalmar campus students, you will be gathering in NI105. So it's in, in down in the basement. And the distance students gather in Connect. So, all right, but feel free to ask any questions. It can be a little bit confusing, maybe. It's not the standard course where you do your laboratory exercises individually, and then you do your exam towards the end, and you get the final grade. So, uh, OK, there is a post in the form. I will take a look at it during the break. Yeah, OK. So we started with the domain modeling last week. And uh, I explained a little bit about what a domain model is. And we uh, found some guidelines for creating a domain model. You should think like a map maker. Uh, explain the problem, find the important concepts, and relate these with associations. You've been thinking a lot about domain modeling during the weekend. Any questions on the first part that we did? Was it hard? So, OK, let's continue then. We have about. Uh, three little things to go through today before we start working on a small assignment. We have a final association to, to talk about. It's my favorite association. Reflexive association. Can anyone figure out what that is about? Yeah, associations to to oneself, so to speak. So we have a have a class, and objects of that class can have links, relationships with other objects of that type, too. So we have a self-association, like that. Deceptively easy in the model, but quite complex, because you can build quite uh, advanced hierarchies of objects this way. It's kind of like recursive, uh, like a file system almost that uh, opens up when you kind of like poke at it. So my example is you have a person. And two persons can make a lot of other persons. And we call these persons parents. And these are babies. So each baby has two parents, and two parents can make a number of babies. This will be forever etched in your memory. And as you see, we also have a small name here that has not been present in the other uh, 
associations that we have been writing down. Uh, we have the multiplicity, but we also have a name. And this is the role name. And that can be a good idea if you want to specify the role that objects on one side, so to speak, play for the other object. So if we have a two person objects, they can play the role of parents. And they can also play the role of babies, two other person objects that are the parents to them. This is often not really used in the analysis. We usually can get by by just using a good association name here. But in this case, I think it's a good idea to add it because it adds some information to our model. Also, in when doing design later on, we will be doing a lot of role names. Role names will become really important. And the name of the association will disappear instead. So, but this is the role, the end part of the association. And typically, you have multiplicity in analysis. And when doing design, you have a role name, you have multiplicity. And you often have navigability also. That is, you have a direction on the association, a small arrow. But we're doing analysis now, so we won't get into that. But you can use role names if you feel that they add some information to your model. But it's not really that usual to do that. So that was the last bit about associations. We will be talking a little bit about attributes. And it's quite, uh, yeah, we could go into qualifiers on associations a little bit later. So uh, attributes and the information. Uh, or data that is needed to, to support the requirements. It's not really that, that hard to envision. If we need to handle uh, the first name of persons, we need some, some uh, compartment to put that uh, information into. So we need to look at what does the user supply to the system, what kind of data comes into the system from the users, and what kind of data is the system supposed to output.
So here we have a person concept with three attributes, first name, last name, and middle name. All of these attributes have a type, the text type. So it's some kind of text string. And the middle name also has a multiplicity because you can have zero or one middle name. Typically, we would like to use primitive data types here. Text, number, date maybe, time. possibly float. I think that you should focus on odd or strange attributes, adding a lot of attributes to each and every type that are kind of like more or less self-explanatory does not really add that much to the experience of the model. It just becomes quite hard to create the model because you need to add all these attributes to them. So I prefer to not add that many attributes and focus on the the strange or the odd or uh, things that you need to uh, have maybe have a problem in, in placing in your model. Okay, where should this information go? And you want to show that uh, very clearly. But just adding a lot of lot of uh, attributes that are quite obvious for the person. Example is for for example, I would not add those uh, those attributes because I think it's okay. It's quite obvious that. The, person can have those. Uh, this could become easier if you have a good tool that supports this in a better way. Maybe you can, uh, can uh, fold the, the, uh, the types so that you don't show the attributes all the time. So you can have different views on your diagrams that you make. So you can both have this very detailed look at your conceptual classes, but also more focus on the relationships. Something that actually works quite well is using just post-it notes. Then you can just write down the attributes on the post-it note, but you can still move them around and, and kind of like model with them. There are also other artifacts that you can use to, uh, to document this kind of uh, data and data types. Uh, you can use the glossary or a data dictionary that explains, OK, a middle name is part of a person, and it uh, can have zero or one middle name, and it should be 255 characters long. You can add really a lot of detail in a data dictionary or in a glossary. So for example, you could have this. Is address a primitive data type?
could possibly do maybe like this. Person. Would that be good? Yeah? Yeah? You are, might want to separate the stuff that goes into an address into different, uh, more detailed uh, items. So, for example, the street address, the number, uh, the country, the zip code. And these also have a relationship. Country and zip code and street address should kind of like match. So, I don't think that's a good idea to model it like this. And in implementation, you, 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 can, you can find that quite a lot because it's, it's kind of kind of convenient to just, oh, oh, it's just a number. The phone number is just a number, or it's a text string. Then you get these uh, so-called painted types. That is, you add, you add rules to a primitive data type, a string, but you then need to add a lot of code often to manage that string so that it is correctly handled in the user interface and in the business rules and stuff like that. So that is probably not a good idea to model an address like that. Rather, as was said, we should model it like a conceptual class. We can add street, zip, uh, country, number maybe also and you can probably find some some uh, more attributes to go in there so maybe the problem then becomes like this have the person and he has a home address also has an invoice address. He also has a deliver your shipment to address. And then we have a supplier. He also has an invoice address and he has a pickup address. And he has a visiting address. And we can probably imagine some other stuff here that has different relationships to this address uh, concept. And this becomes quite messy, quite quickly. So this will probably not make your model as readable as it should be, because you have kind of like all these more or less obvious relationships, and they will clutter your important relationships, the things that you actually want to show. So the problem is then that the address is it's kind of like a primitive data type, but it's, it's a little bit more than a primitive data type. So you can actually do it like this.
you can use it as a type for your uh, arguments. This should, of course, be used with care. Because now you kind of like move the relationships, the associations, into the class and they become invis invisible. You don't see them visually. You need to read here. Okay, person has a relationship to the address type, to the address concept but it can add a lot of readability for you. This is called the data type class and you should not use this to hide important associations. So you should not do something like this. Mm. Yeah. That is wrong in so many ways. <laughs> no, but at least two ways it's wrong. It is wrong because it hides the important association between a person and a car. It is also wrong because it's kind of like it's a database domain model. It uses some kind of identifier for the person and, and uh, in the car you have an identifier that links a car to a person. And you don't see the relationship here. It's hidden. Also, these kind of attributes does not add any information really. You don't know w what that relationship is about. You just know it's a link between a car and a person. But what is it about? Yeah? I wonder in the presence of that person where you I don't know, so I can just give the telephone home address there. Hmm? The model here and that's the object that the model and operate on the address. Yeah, I think you should add the data type class in the model, but it can it can be up in the corner or something like that. Uh in, in some domain models you get a small collection of, of these kind of obvious classes like address uh, and you can just put them up in in the corner of your your model or put them in, in a separate package but we haven't been talking in package about packages yet but it should be in the model so this should rather be modeled modeled like this then have a visual association so we can see the link between the person and the car and we have some information that tells us okay this link is about ownership probably a legal ownership of a vehicle of a car so you can't go wrong by doing this Technically, it's correct, but the quality of your model will probably suffer because you, you don't get the visual uh, expressiveness that you need. You can go wrong if you do stuff like that because you may accidentally hide relationships that are important. 
So use this with care and uh, opt for using the association with the association names if you are not sure. Yes, one small uh, detail for attributes. So we kind of like have this this uh, model of a, a receipt. The receipt consists of a lot of rows. Each row add an attribute, the number of items for that uh, row, and the item has a price. And we want to know this total sum. The sum is an important concept, uh, important, important piece of information for the receipt. If we are to be uh, more exact. But as you probably understand, the sum can be computed using their relationships and information from the other types. And this can be important also to stress when writing down your attributes. We want to show clearly that the receipt has a sum. Maybe it's stated in the requirements that the receipt has, has that. So we can compute the, the sum for the receipt by using the rows and using the item prices. So we can add a small slash in front of that to show that it is a derived attribute, exactly as we had derived associations. Yeah. One thing that is uh, often more important uh, that, than you think, and that we have touched this also before, is the concept of history and time intervals. This is something that is more common than you think. And as developers, we kind of like think that the world is simple and beautiful, but it's often more complex and more ugly than we think. And this is something that also is uh, not really often clearly asked for by stakeholders, customers, and end users, because they think it's so inherently for the problem domain that, okay, of course, you need to have access to historical data. And uh, the best way to model this is using some kind of time intervals. And we can use the example once more uh, with the uh, receipt. And the row. and the item.
And the problem here is that the item, of course, has a price. And the receipt is a kind of like a valuable object for the end user, for the customer to use. But if you change the item price, and the sum of the receipt is computed, it's like the sum of the receipt changes over time. So you don't really know what the item cost was when you hand in the receipt. So how should this be modeled? You could move up price to the row. So when you create the receipt, you make a copy of the item price. This is quite uh, similar to, to what it is in real life. The receipt is a print printout. You have a copy of the exact item price on the receipt when you get the receipt. So this is quite a natural thing to do in this case. That's on the plus side. However, it's redundant information. You need price both in the item and in the row. And of course, you can have other requirements that you don't really know if they will weigh into this right now. And it is likely that prices for items will change during the lifetime of the system. You can't really expect the item price to be fixed for a number of years, probably. So this is then better modeled using some kind of time intervals. And a model for this problem could look something like this. You probably have a date of purchase when the transaction was made and the date when you get your receipt, yeah? So when you make a domain log, you can actually draw a line between two attributes and two subcontracts? No, that was just an example. You cannot do, draw the... No, that, that, that's not part of the model. That's part of my explanation. And also, when you have the data classes, is there no subtext to Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, there is there is no real syntax for the data type and distinguishing between data type primitive data types and and data type classes. There is no such uh, Yeah, I think that in in the analysis the number of primitive data types is quite small. You have like text bool integer, number, or something like that. It, it, you should focus on these kind of like uh, natural primitive data types in, in analysis. In design, it's, it's more detailed, probably. There you have integer, and you have float, and, and, and stuff like that. And maybe characters, strings, or something like that. In analysis, it's, it's a little bit broader. And also, if you add your primitive data types to your model, you kind of like have them in your model anyway. So you can see that, okay, address, it's a type in my model. 
So, but you have a, a, a date for your receipt, when it was issued or when the transaction was made, when you buy your items. You still have your rows. And you have your item. And, but we should probably add a concept here then. item price. And over time, an item can have a lot of item prices. And using the date and the receipt, you can scan through the rows, and you can scan through the items, and you can find the item price that was valid on that exact date. So you can compute the, the sum correctly. So this gives us the opportunity to have this historical information. And historical information is probably something that is needed in many more cases than you think right now. And this also adds complexity to both the analysis, design, and implementation. So this is something that you should be wary of from the start. And always ask your end users and your customers for, for this need. Do we need to store this over time? Is this something that you need to, to know later on? Get the question here. Uh, does this model also cover items not for sale anymore? Probably it could by using a, a, if the item does not have a price for the, for, the, for the current time period. It could be that the item was for sale some, some, uh, some time ago, but it, it's not anymore. So it could, could possibly be used for that. It, it's not something that I've been, been thinking about, actually. So. But uh, that is an important point, I think. Get another question, how do you handle time zones and stuff like that? I don't really uh, think it's a lot different. Uh, possibly the, the uh, we're slipping into a little bit of implementation, the details rather than an analysis, but uh, possibly the, the uh, the server runs in a central location within one time zone, and that's the time that it's used throughout the system. Uh, but you could, of course, maybe have some differentiation for, for if you have different, different uh, types of customers, maybe from different geographic locations should have different, uh, different prices. So you could add a location to your item price also. So customers in Europe pay one price, customers in the US pay another price. Customers from this location pays yet another price. So it could be, and probably it's more <coughs> complex than you think. And in e-commerce, it is not unusual that you get a special price. You can have individualized prices for each customer. 
because we know that this dude has been surfing a lot of Android uh, plates and has been watching Android plates on the several different sites. So we give him a special deal when he enters our site, a special price. So, oh, time runs. I think we will do a, a quick, uh, quick uh, thing here about generalization and specialization. This is a powerful concept. We have been. Uh, You have seen it before. We have a vehicle type, it has a register number, and we have a car, and we have a boat. So we have these two. Oh, that was not that pretty. We have these two concepts that are more special, car and boat, but we would like to be able to reason about them and use them as vehicles in our model. So some parts of our system, some parts of our model uses just vehicles. It knows only about vehicles. But some other parts knows about cars and knows about boats. So we need to be able to, to model that relationship. And we can do that with the generalization and specialization. And that's this arrow. This is a powerful concept, and you should use it with care. There are a few rules of thumb. The 100% rule, that is all of the information, all of the attributes and relations of the more general concept should apply to the more special concepts. So if you have a vehicle that does not have a registration number, maybe a bicycle, something will become wonky in your hierarchy. Because you should not use generalization, specialization, and the attribute registration number on that level then. So then you either have a problem in your thinking, or you need to move down the registration number into something else. You should also be able to say is a, a car is a vehicle, a boat is a vehicle. And it should make sense. You could probably find stuff that has a registration number, but it's not a vehicle. So it fulfills the 100% rule, but it does not fulfill the is a rule. The specializations should add something to your model. That is attributes or associations. or they should be handled differently. So the more special parts should add something 
in the model. Otherwise, you could just speak about vehicles. You don't need to distinguish cars from boats. And this is something that you probably will get from, from uh, end users. You could imagine someone taking an insurance claim, and if you study how they work, you could, uh, or interview them, they could, will probably say things like, okay, and the, the customer supplies the car registration number, and we make a damage report or damage claim. So you will probably hear a lot of these specializations. So it is your job as an analysis to find out if they really add something or if you could just speak about vehicles. And that brings me to the final thing about domain models, really. If you walk into a store, and you find a person working in the store and you ask them, oh, could I please buy a fruit? What will they give you? A fruit? So what will you get? You really can't buy a fruit. You need to buy an apple or a banana or a pear or something like that. You can't really go out from the store with a fruit. There is no such object as a fruit in the real world. You only have these really concrete objects like the banana or the apple or the grape or so they will probably look at you and ask, OK, what kind of fruit do you want? I want a fruit. And then you will get the poisonous banana because they can't sell them anymore. So you have this concept of abstract base classes. And that's classes that are used for abstraction purposes only. No objects can really be of that type. Oh, and the notation is quite uh, messy for this, I think, because it's supposed to be in italics when you make an abstract base class, and that can be a bit wonky to write. But you can also make a tagged value. For it. To show that it is abstract. So actually, I could not find. <laughs> Thinking about it, I could not find an, an example from, from reality, so to speak, where you have a, uh, a base class that is not abstract. <laughs> because in real life, everything is from, made of, out of concrete types. Like with the fruit, for example. We like to reason about fruit. Oh, it's healthy. And we ascribe a lot of different attributes to to fruits, but you can't really handle, you can't really buy a fruit, you can't really eat a fruit. You eat an apple or you eat a banana or you eat a strawberry. Possibly it is only in human-made artifacts that we can deal with abstract concepts like, like this and not in the real world. 
so we can create pos possibly create systems where okay you can have a just you can have a vehicle a type of vehicle you can have objects of that type in your system but in real life there exists no vehicles there exists only cars and boats and bicycles and skateboards or whatnot questions time is of the essence here so use generalization and specialization with care it is easy to go overboard with these with these hierarchies and they can cause more problems than they are worth we are good at making assumptions and generalizations as humans quite quickly and they may not always be correct when you investigate those uh, in more detail all right we will take a break now but before we take the break uh, you can have uh, you should work on a small modeling problem you can read the problem description during the break and start modeling if you want to but we will take about 15 to 20 minutes of the last lecture for you to work uh, on your models and then we will do some kind of uh, presentation I will present my solution to this uh, modeling problem uh, the modeling problem is present on the course homepage for you who are distance based you can look at the lecture and you have a problem description both in Swedish and in English it, and it's the same problem description for you on campus I have made 15 printouts I don't know if it's, if it's enough but uh, it probably is so you can take a paper copy of the problem description if you want to but read it and uh, uh, we will uh, enter we will meet here again in, in 15 minutes and start working on our models but now a 15-minute break. <laughs>